Good Gab, sponsored by Skillskin, a nonprofit organization empowering individuals with disabilities through employment. Good morning, everybody. Uh, today, we have the great pleasure to have Patrick Stryker here with the Office of Neighborhood Services. Patrick, thanks for joining us. I, I am so happy to be here. Yeah, I'm just uh, happy uh, today's today's a good day. How's your day going, Patrick? It's pretty good. It's a Friday. That's yeah. That's always a good thing. No doubt. Um, well, we're really excited to have you here today. Um, you know, a lot of stuff happening in the city. Uh, I noticed, you know, when your name came up on our podcast, we kind of worked together. You were my boss for a short period of time. Very short period of time. <laughs> yeah, it was nice. As I was coming into Skillskin, you mm -hmm. were kind of leaving uh, the board and yeah. your service. And, yeah. Um, you worked for Skillskin too, right? I did. I worked there for, I think it was four years. That's something awesome. Something like that. Yeah, it was great. I had a great time there. Started off as a staffing manager in the employment um, department and then uh, in short order, ended up becoming the director of employment services. So I had a great time. Well, Brian Beeler says hi, by the way. <laughs> I yeah, love Brian. Like, yeah. I run into him every now and again. It's so awesome to see him. I love Brian. Yeah. Heck yeah. We're just uh, continuing to evolve that department nice. and, mm -hmm. and our organization and just yeah. seeing how we can kind of be like the one stop shop uh, for disability in town. Yeah. Um, if, you know, people are have questions or, about employment and how to, you know, either get services be employed mm -hmm. maybe some training like we're just trying to be that that place so. yeah which is so needed yeah. and i know at least when i was there gosh the services that were provided were always so good and it is great how many of the staff that were there when i was there are still mm -hmm. there and i'm still in contact with and, and that's always pretty cool too heck yeah, yeah. i know it's like just it's a, a great core group yeah it really for is. sure yeah. well uh, we're interested it's like um how long have you been in spokane Oh, gosh. I moved out to Spokane in 97 when I graduated high school. So back when I was a young man, and I look at all the gray hair. Because this is like on video, too. Oh, yeah. Right? yeah. Oh, yeah. How's my beard look? We're looking good. It's um, amazing, it's, right? I know. Yeah. Fellow man with a <laughs> yes. nice beard. Oh, makes me happy. But I uh, came out in 97, went to Whitworth, um, did four years there, loved it, and then went on to get my um, master's of business administration. But I, I just never left Spokane. Um, came out here for college, thought I'd end up going somewhere else. And, um, you know, the Spokane slogan, near nature, near perfect. I, as far as towns go, I mean, I love being near nature, the rivers, and I'm um, a big fisherman and stuff. And so love going fishing. And, and as far as cities go, I mean, nobody's perfect, but it is near perfect in, in my eyes. And so, um, yeah, I've just never left Spokane. Yeah, that's awesome. I'm not planning yeah. on it. Yeah, it's an incredible spot. What uh, part of the world did you grow up in? Um, the farmlands up north of Seattle. Oh, okay. Yeah. I, uh, past Marysville. Yeah, Marysville is it, which you go there now and it's it's trippy. I don't even recognize it. Like, you know, I'll go and say, hey, you know, to my son, hey, you see that Best Buy? I used to hoe corn there. And, um, you know, see that Costco? That was a strawberry field. It's just weird. I, I don't even recognize yeah, it. The now. strawberries, the blueberries, <laughs> everything. They still got tulips, though, right? Uh, yeah, up, up, I think north, some, but even that, I don't even know. I just, it's weird to go back. There. I know it's like a city that I five corridor oh, continues yeah. to develop and yeah, the casino and, and everything, but they got a nice Cabela's there. True so statement. <laughs> I am a fellow fisherman, so I can appreciate that. Um, I know some of that, um, I guess growth or urbanization, of it's happening here too, right? We're just, we're seeing our city change and mm -hmm. uh, expand. More people have found mm -hmm. out about near nature, near perfect. And yeah. It's like Spokane was this sort of uh, best kept hidden secret type of thing for so long. And I don't know, a few years ago, it was like word got out about the awesomeness of Spokane. And so it's amazing how many people that I'll talk to. And I'm like, oh, how long have you been in Spokane? Six months, a year, two years. And so a lot of outsiders coming in. But you can't blame them. It is a great city. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. I I, I know things uh, as it progresses, like I used to be surprised, right? Hearing those same conversations. You're like, oh, yeah, I moved here. And I'm like, why? <laughs> But then, you know, the early 2000s happened and yeah. just watching that transformation mm -hmm. and we've got an amazing city at this point. Yeah. Yeah, we really do. And I, I love that there is still that kind of 
to some degree, almost a small town feel. And, and like I said, we've got all, all the nature that surrounds us, but we have everything you want in a big city, um, except a zoo. That's the one thing we don't have. And my son brings that up. He's uh, 10, almost 11. And he brings that up constantly. Like, Dad, why don't we have a zoo? Why don't we have a zoo? Well, I don't know. But other than a zoo, we got about everything you'd want. Uh, when you first came here, did the zoo still exist out at Mirabu Park? I, I don't. I don't know. Um, I don't think so. I think it closed in the early 90s. There used to be a zoo. Exactly. Spokane they, had it. I remember the yeah. giraffes. Yes. <laughs> that comes up. And I know we've got cattails, yeah. which is awesome, but it's, it's not a full zoo. And But yeah, I, I think the the one out of Mirabu, I think, yeah, it was just before my time. I like it. Well, see, we can dream Spokane. We can have it again. <laughs> That's yeah. right. We need to start like a movement, like get mm-hmm. Spokane a zoo. And you heard it here first today on your podcast. Yes, we Get did. Spoken. <laughs> it's a zoo. Let's support it right here, right now. Oh, I love it. Well, I would. I know our listeners were real interested about you know the, your career and mm-hmm. your time with cops. Like, just yeah, maybe help us understand kind of what that program was and and what you saw during your time there. Uh, which one at cops? Yeah, yeah. So gosh, the. I just left COPS, now the director of the Office of Neighborhood Services for Spokane, but was eight years at COPS. And if you're not familiar with it, COPS uh, is affiliated with the Spokane Police Department. It stands for Community Oriented Policing Services. And so it handles a lot of the volunteers and crime prevention uh, that are with, for the police department. And so there are nine COPS shops around town, and the shops are great. That's where you can go if you've been victimized by crime, whatever. And, um, like, what, what do I do now? What are those next steps? I mean, okay, I can report it, but how do I make sure this doesn't happen again? Or why is this happening? You go into your cop shop, talk to somebody. They'll give you the um, advice, talk you through it. Here's next steps. Here's how you can make sure you're not going to get victimized again. So the shops are great. And then there's all the different programs like um, the off-road patrol where uh, we're taking ATVs and getting out into some of the rural parks. And um, again, as we're talking about uh, parks and being near nature and stuff, I we have so many rural parks that are city parks, um, Palisades, People, um, yep. uh, High Bridge that are huge, massive parks that we're seeing a lot of issues. Um, and so we started the off-road program to get in there because you get these areas that are only accessible either by foot or ATV. Um, and so getting back in there and that was just just dynamite. And um, you know anybody can get involved in that. Uh, Pause on Patrol was a great program we had for um, capitalizing on People who walk their dogs and getting you trained up what to look for, how to report it. Uh, the mounted patrol with the horses and uh, neighborhood observation patrol where you can um, use retired squad cars from the police department and uh, kind of patrol your neighborhood and, and not making arrests or anything, but just being the eyes and ears for the police Be department. And, yeah, exactly. And so a lot of great programs through the, the COPS program that um, was just so fun. And I loved it and I had been passionate about it, the idea of making use of communities. And that's why I love my, my current job right now at the Office of Neighborhood Services, because at the end of the day, if you want to get anything done, it comes through your community. And so if we look at something like cops, you know, the, the mentality becomes, well, if there's crime, it's a police problem. It's a police problem. No, it's a community problem. And um, uh, and, and so how does the community engage um, to deal with that stuff? And, and I could go on for hours about that, but um, it, it's just fun to get people engaged and understand what their role is um, and make use of community and you know I was talking about places like North Dakota it's so interesting that in the dead of winter in North Dakota you go to um, like a grocery store there and um, you'll have like 30 cars in the grocery store parking lot and they're all running none of them are off because when it's 40 below right it's not, it's not gonna might, start might not. and so it's interesting because you can see all these cars in the parking lot and they're running and nobody touches them perfectly safe if you did that in spokane man they'd all be gone in right. two minutes and so it's like what why what what is happening that you can do that in another place but you couldn't hear that's just a culture problem and it, you know of, of um whether it's spokane or any community and and so that's where it takes engaging the community to say what are we going to allow and what aren't we and um you know parents you have a role teachers you have a role neighborhoods you have a role and and so do police but it's everybody so I, I appreciate that perspective because there's a lot of times, you know, I might be in rooms or at events, and people are like property crime and, you know, police aren't doing anything and just you hear a lot of stuff. Right. But knowing that there's uh, avenues for people to uh, participate in mm-hmm. this, get involved in your neighborhoods yeah. and and try to see if we can come up with some solutions 
like I like that kind of language and to spread that word. Uh, yeah, for, for sure. Yeah, it's it's pretty fascinating. A few years ago, I had done a um, this big convention um, across the state, and so I was doing a presentation in front of a few hundred people, and I was co-presenting with a guy named uh, Dr. Dale Linda Kugel, who who knows maybe he's listening. He's a uh, professor at Eastern Washington University of uh, Sociology. So we're presenting, and he used this example that blew my mind, and, and I use a lot. He said, uh, as we were talking about crime and stuff, he said to the audience, I want you to think about nationwide Amish communities. And he said, how many police officers are there in Amish communities? Zero. They, it's just not what they do. He said, but how much crime do you have in Amish communities? Also zero. And he said, they also have no homelessness, no poverty, no you know anything like that. But no government intervention. He said, it's because they take care of each other. They're self-regulated. And they do it all peacefully. Nobody's armed. It's not like they're stoning people or whatever. Very peaceful. But they work with their communities. And so they have their own mechanisms for dealing with things in these very peaceful, positive ways. But he goes, as a sociologist, he goes, we study them incredibly. Why, why does it work for you guys? And it's so positive and you don't have these issues. And certainly they're not perfect, but you just don't see some of the, and anyhow, it just kind of blew my mind is, yeah, it can be done. It can be done. And so then trying to tie that into the communities to say, you have a lot more power than you think that you do. You just need to tap into that and organize and do it in those positive, uh, you know, peaceful ways. And so to me, it was just kind of a thought experiment with those guys and go, yeah, it can be done. Well, and yeah. And with that attitude and, and pulling the right, the right people together yeah. and in, in the same direction. I agree with you. Yeah. And I'm curious is it you, you're taking on this role at neighborhood mm -hmm. services. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, you've been here 25 plus years. It's a, uh, I'm happy to see personally, you know, homegrown person coming to the step in and yeah. see if we can help. But uh, I'm also surprised. It's like, it's been a rough few years and uh, it takes a certain person to step into this. Like why, why did you want to step into the light right now? Gosh, I think uh, for a couple reasons. So part of it is for my eight years at cops, I've worked alongside the neighborhood councils and the office of neighborhood services so much because that's where the community um, gets involved is through ONS and through those neighborhood councils. And then with cops, that's where the community is. And so they, there was a natural intersection there. So for the eight years at COPS, I, I've presented at neighborhood councils more times than I could count. And so I'm plugged in with most of the neighborhood leaders. Uh, and I'm familiar with them. Uh, staff at ONS, I've been familiar with the previous director, Carly Courtright, an awesome person, known her for years. And so when her position became open as that director, it just kind of seemed like a natural fit. And so... Uh, just kind of asking around and stuff and, and um, kind of looking at it and going, gosh, I love my job at COPS. I've been so happy there, but this is also great. And um, it just seemed like a, a natural fit, a natural slide into it, but also that that next challenge. And so um, just happened to apply and um, I guess I interview well because I ended up with the position. I don't know, uh, but I'm really excited. And, and it is good because the past few years, Boy, you know, and I know, you know, pandemic, 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 but I think to some degree, even though that's a you know, battle cry on so many levels, you can't understate how the pandemic changed everything in society. That's it true. really did. You know, how, how we interact with each other, how our businesses look, um, how we go about our day to day basis, you know, and so we're still kind of coming back from that. I don't know that we ever fully will. Um, and so, uh, you know, knowing that that brought its challenges and, so many organizations uh, struggled and floundered and it just became so different. And so how do we rebuild? Um, and it just seemed like there is a challenge, but it's a challenge that I look forward to because because I want the end result to say, okay, look at the numbers of community engagement pre-COVID, <clears throat> pre -COVID, and it's sort of struggled since then for, for a lot of the neighborhood councils and stuff. So how do we go back to the, the pre-COVID times? Can we? How does that look? But but knowing that we need to. And so there is that challenge, but but it excites me. And I love it because I love engaged communities. And I love just like being a cop, seeing what can happen when people do get involved in the difference we make. And so I'm incredibly excited and passionate about that. And then it was a challenge that I was like, yeah, it is a challenge. It's not easy, but I want it and it's mine and let's do this. Yeah. yeah. Well, so for those who don't really know about you know the offices and neighborhood mm -hmm. services and kind of all the aspects that you get into maybe help us understand a little bit about you know why it exists and you know how 
that office engages. Yeah. So we'll nerd out for a minute. Yeah. Yes. The uh, uh, Spokane City Charter was added to, and gosh, I think it was 92 or something like that, that the people voted to add this idea of the neighborhood councils and the community assembly, which is sort of the representatives from the neighborhood councils that come together, um, and the Office of Neighborhood Services. So that was actually put in the charter, which is basically, you know, your city's constitution, more or less. Um, and so it's actually in there as the community saying it's important enough that that we want neighborhoods to be involved at that neighborhood level and have some representation in our city government and for the community to, to engage and influence what happens in their neighborhood. You know, that's important. And so um, there are some other cities that have similar ideas, but not a ton of them. Um, really? So we're kind of unique in that way a little, little bit? bit? Yeah, yeah, there, yeah, there cool. are some, but but not as many as I would have thought. Yeah. And um, But Spokane does have that, and so it's great that each neighborhood has a voice. And so what's going on in your neighborhood, you can get involved with your neighborhood council and have some influence on in terms of what happens in your area. Do you want to see uh, this or that? Do you want it to look and feel like this or that? Um, and so you, you can have a voice instead of having to always come to like a city council meeting and, you know, address city council, you can do it at the neighborhood level. And so, um, you know, ONS then is the charter department to help facilitate that, help work with the, the neighborhoods um, and make it as effective as we can be so that people do have a voice. And I love it when I hear these stories of, you know, neighborhood councils that, you know, that were seeing an issue in the neighborhood. People started coming together and galvanizing and saying, what do we want this to look like? And then bringing it to fruition and turning it into something really really good and positive and making their neighborhood what they wanted it to be. And I'm like, yes, yeah. it's the way that's supposed to work in a democracy. So I love it. Okay. So I'm really curious now I'm thinking about some of like the big changes that have happened in neighborhoods. I'm thinking about, uh, the Perry district, Garland, mm -hmm. the Monroe corridor. So neighborhood councils kind of helped affect some of that change. Is that yeah. fair? Yeah. And so, I mean, at the end of the day, the final decision is still going to rest with, you know, the mayor's office and city council. But the whole point of the neighborhood councils is to be that liaison of the community and what they want with your city government to provide that input. And so, yeah, they can absolutely affect change. And it's, it's just awesome to see it. And so as, okay, I'm going to keep diving down this hole here because I'm really interested. Um, so the neighborhood councils, they're meeting, they're creating agendas, they're, they have some policy they would like to look at. Like, how does that go from that room to the mayor's office, to the city council uh, folks? Who are... So you'll have the, the ONS representatives that can kind of help um, facilitate it and bring things together. Typically at a neighborhood council meeting, you'll have like a city council member that is present and so they can kind of hear things directly. Um, but then it's, it's the neighborhood council then engaging, trying to get people together and, um, really formulate what is the issue or what is it they want to see. Um, put that in writing, put, put a little pencil to paper there in terms of what is it we're after and then moving it up the chain and then it can go to the mayor's office and, and city council and they can look at it and say okay let's do it this way or not or whatever uh, again they're going to do on their end again neighborhood councils don't have final say but uh, what I love is we have a city government that is is active and does listen and, and again just because you didn't get what you wanted doesn't mean they weren't listening I always want right. people to understand that um, but to see city officials. I mean, I know the mayor last night was in the Browns Edition Neighborhood Council addressing them and hearing their concerns just last night. And that's a great way for the mayor to be in the public and say, I want to hear from you. And so it was done at the Neighborhood Council level as textbook of how that's supposed to work. So, um, you know, love seeing stuff like that so that people can have access, that the mayor isn't this... Um, far off person who exists only in city hall boom there she is in your neighborhood saying hey let's talk what's on your mind it's perfect right that position yeah. doesn't have to be a pedestal they can be in yeah. the community hearing. yeah yeah i know uh, i was at an event um with dana our producer of the show uh, last friday uh for the common good and uh, there was a recorded video of Betsy Wilkerson and mm -hmm. Jonathan Bingle, mm -hmm. and they were talking too about the uh, neighborhood councils yeah. and that. And they reiterated what you just said. It's like they hear, yeah, <laughs> and they're listening. They can't always make it actionable, yeah. 
Yeah. And it might not be for the common good, but they will hear you. Yeah. I just love that. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it doesn't just go in a hole somewhere. Yeah. And, you know, I, I think we live in a world of, you know, we always want to shoot off emails or post to social media. Okay, great, but it's not necessarily going to be as effective. So how can I affect change? Well, it's by getting involved with your neighborhood and, and kind of galvanizing the people around you. And Because if you're seeing an issue or, or something that you really like, that you're like, let's do more of this, well, probably the people around you are noticing the same thing, but it's nobody knows how, how to make that happen. And that's where you start is with your neighborhood council. And, and you can go to the city's website and it's, it's actually really well done uh, through the neighborhood council page of uh, the map. And so you can see exactly where you live and what your neighborhood council is and who your chair and co-chair and, you know, reps are and when they meet and where and um, all that information is out there for you. You just need to go get it and do it. Yeah, I feel like I missed out. I, I now live uh, just kind of in unincorporated Spokane County on mm. the um, the West Plains out there. Oh, sure. But when I was in town, I'm like, I remember seeing the notices that would come through the mail, mm-hmm. and I just didn't quite understand. I was just too young at the time. Yeah. Uh, but I think I, I don't think I know. I missed out on that opportunity just to be involved. Yeah, yeah. And then, of course, there's the different programs that ONS runs that are neighborhood-based as well. So <clears throat> you may know that um, in your neighborhoods you get um, the neighborhood cleanup events, and, and I love those. Um, so this is when only... they're picking up leaves and things yeah, like that? Yeah, they'll do usually one in the spring that is more um, like spring cleaning. And so, like, I know I lived in uh, Emerson Garfield neighborhood for uh, 10 years right off of Corbin Park there, and we'd have our big spring cleanup where... All the neighbors would show up. They'd have those big green dumpsters. And, you know, if you lived in the, that neighborhood council, um, it was free. And you could show up with your car or truck or whatever and all the just garbage that, you know, that we all accumulate. Oh, yeah. You could Don't come look and, in my garage. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. You could come and, and just clean it up. And it was a great way to clean up your neighborhood, start talking to your neighbors, um, you know, and working through the COPS program. I can tell you, even if you look at something like neighborhood cleanups, there is... Um, a concept called crime prevention through environmental design, which is the idea that that goes really deep, but um, and there's all kinds of aspects to it. But one of them is neighborhoods that are, have a lot of junk and the graffiti and the cars on blocks and stuff. You're going to get more crime statistically than if your neighborhood looks sharp. And if you're sending that message of people don't care what goes on around here versus people do care, that affects crime. So even those neighborhood cleanup things, we were involved with that through the cops program because like, no, if you're trying to have a crime-free neighborhood, one of the things you can do is clean up your neighborhood and send that message that, no, we care what goes on around here. So don't try your shenanigans around here. Uh, But those neighborhood cleanup events are great and we do those. um, And that information comes through your neighborhood council. Traffic call me, man, I tell you, 15 years ago, it wasn't a big thing, but boy, the past two, three, four years, traffic concerns and speeders and stuff like that has really risen as one of the top concerns in the city. So if there are streets that are a problem, that comes through your neighborhood council of where do we want to prioritize in this neighborhood to get the city, um, the uh, street engineering department and stuff like that. Well, where do we want to prioritize? So that's, that's like whether like redesigning certain mm-hmm. elements yeah. or maybe even something as simple as like putting out like those speed signs, right? Yeah. I, I saw that happen in my neighborhood this yep. summer. Um, thank goodness. One of my neighbors, uh, definitely knocked on the County's door a few times and we got one of those, uh, electric signs that you know, had a little light. that flashed Oh yeah. On it. Mm-hmm. it worked. I kind of sat on my porch and just watched people would be cruising through and you know, it's like a 25 mile an hour yep. there and people are doing 45 and man, the, it changed behavior for a while. It does. And that was and cool. So, yeah. And so those um, are available during the summer months through ONS. Um, and again, how do you request those? Through your neighborhood council. The uh, You probably saw those yellow signs that said neighbors drive 25. Yes, Again, I saw that all just, up in Altamont by my yeah, parents' house. Yeah, it's just a good reminder. I mean, is it a game changer, those signs? Well, no, but uh, you're always going to have people that just don't give a rip one way or another. But I think when it comes to something like speeding, most of us, it's just good normal people that were rocking out to you know Led Zeppelin and lost uh, track how fast you were going, and you see either that flashing radar or the sign, and you look at your speedometer, and go oh oh yep going a little fast, and you slow down, and so it really does make a difference for for average people that were just driving. But again, that's through ONS and neighborhood councils. Um, so you've, you've got uh, programs like that, even community engagement um, grants that city council gives us. So each neighborhood council can do events throughout the year to just bring. Community 
community together and get to know each other. That's through ONS and your neighborhood council. There's so much that goes on that, you know, I wish more people were aware of. And so, you know, a good advertising campaign is something that, uh, you know, I know I've talked to staff about and we're trying to work on that. And I'm working with some of the city communications people to say, hey, what can we do to get the word out? Especially because if, if you're not from Spokane, you probably have no idea that these neighborhood councils right. exist. Yeah, especially so, if it's not a thing in other cities. Like, yeah. It's a unique thing. So for a lot of people listening right now, you're hearing it here first on this <laughs> podcast. Neighborhood councils, get involved. In game. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and, and so trying to get that word out um, because that is how you make your communities better because that's what everyone, at the end of the day, where we live in our neighborhood around us, that affects all of us. And everybody wants those safe positive, family friendly, um, you know, places that we can raise our kids and go for a run and do all those things. And the question is, how do you make that happen? Start with your neighborhood councils. It makes sense to me. Um, what is, what does an event look like? Like, what would someone expect if they were going to come to a community event, a community event? Gosh, those are, are so different and so crazy. So you'll have, um, so each neighborhood has got a feel. Yeah. And, and that's what yeah. makes it fun is every neighborhood real. is so different. Yeah. Because your neighborhood is who's putting that together. And so based on the culture of your neighborhood and what people want, those events are going to be totally different. If you're in, um, you know, Hilliard versus, um, you know, the uh, Nevada Heights versus Rockwood, you know, they're just all different. And so um, some of the, those events might be like a concert in the park. I mean, I know like Autobahn, Downriver and stuff, they, they do those. Um, it's great concert in the park. Some of them might be a big potluck. Some of them might be, um, you know, a band that's playing on a closed kind of big block party with booths and fun and stuff like that. They're, they're just all different. Sounds fun. Yeah. Yeah, they are just fun, free ways to engage with your neighbors. And, um, they're always fun. I love going to those neighborhood events and some of them are huge. Some of them are a little smaller, uh, but that's what makes them fun is they're all different. And, uh, you know, if you get excited about that, great, get involved with your neighborhood council and maybe be on the committee that helps make that happen. I start to think about just, Thank goodness not everyone's like me. I am the neighborhood <laughs> person who's going to go find out your name. I'll learn kids' names. I'll figure out what's going on because I'm genuinely interested yeah. in people. So yeah. I I have a pretty good uh, you know relationship with my neighbors and just learn what's going on. But I hear a lot of my friends, they talk about that. I'm like, hey, yeah, what's your neighbor doing? Uh, I don't know their name. Yeah. That seems dangerous to me. It's like, what? You don't know your neighbor's name? It, it blows my mind. And one of the things I've talked about, like, you know, uh, particularly with cops and stuff, is it, it's amazing to me how many people I can, you know, can tell me what their best friend who lives 300 miles away had for breakfast. And I'm like, how do you know? Well, because he put it on social media. I'm like, okay, but tell me what your next door neighbor's names are and what they do for a living. And I'm like, I don't know. Why don't you know that? Well, because they're not on social media. Well, like, you know, as a community, I think we we focus on things like social media. And so we end up losing that sense of what's happening around us. And um, this is a big thing. A little while ago, I was talking about SEPTED, that crime prevention through environmental design. Blows my mind how even architecture affects how we interact with each other. If you think of old neighborhoods when I lived in Corbin Park and those big Victorian craftsman houses. Those big front, front porches. porches. And, yep. and the only that's you know, that's what you did at the end of the day. You sat out on your front porch, so you knew your neighbors, you could see what's going on. But once the TV was invented, people are like, Well, I don't want to hang out on my front porch anymore. I want to watch TV. And so now then, you know, uh, houses in the 50s and 60s started being arranged, having TV rooms. Now, you know, everything is on the backside Back of the house. Decks. So that yeah, <laughs> you can interact with your family and TV and not with your neighbors. I get it that some people want that, but that if you're trying to build community, it doesn't help anything. And so sometimes being cognizant of that and saying, okay, if the architecture of my house always puts me in my TV room, then I need to make an effort to be out. Oh, I'm hitting the mic here. The I gesture yeah, when I talk. We are. That's, I, yeah. Everybody makes fun of me because like, if you cut off my hands, I couldn't communicate anymore. Um, <laughs> the uh, it, it, Being cognizant of that and saying, if I want to get to know my neighbors, then it might not come naturally the way it would have when everybody sat out on their front porch. So I'm going to have to be intentional about that, of being outside more. When my neighbors pull up into their driveway, walking over to the fence line and saying, hey, what's up, man? And, and starting those conversations and being intentional because it doesn't quite happen organically like it would have, um, not only because of uh, maybe the architecture of our house, but just the fact that we do spend time in front of TV and on social media and not outside playing in the streets or whatever, like, you know, we did as kids, you know, kids today are 
always on video games and stuff like that. I see that. And, you know, like for my son, I was like, yeah, we're not doing that. Right. Right. Just go play with your friends, <laughs> you know? And, um, and, and so trying to be intentional yeah. that if your kid plays video games, gr- great, but let's try and incorporate some time to go out on the street and play with your friends and um, get to know your neighbors. And if you're, you know, you don't want to be brave like that right away and you want to just wade into this, go to a neighborhood council event. Mm-hmm. There will be people like me. And Pat, <laughs> and, and we will talk to you. It yeah. will happen. And it'll just, you'll start to form those relationships in your neighborhood. And it just that community building, I just, personally, I don't think you can have enough of it. No, yeah. no. And you know what? what's funny is how often I think people just have never gone to something like that. And it's like, come on, get outside your comfort zone. Just go. And it amazes me how many times I'll, I'll hear from somebody like, yeah, I went to this, you know, block party or one of my community parties. And like, you know what? It was fun. And then I'm like, why don't we do this more often? And it's like, yes, that's what I'm talking about. You just got to go that first time, have fun. And then you're like, dude, we should start doing this monthly, man. Why are we doing this once or twice a year? Yeah. Community. Yeah, exactly. Oh, I love it. Yeah. I can't believe it. We blinked and our time just uh, went by today. Patrick, I'm just curious. Do you have anything uh, that you'd like to leave with our listeners today to uh, any words of wisdom or Anything you've been thinking about you want everyone to hear? Yeah, that I guess would just be, and I've basically said it you know, this whole time, but get involved, whether that's with your neighborhood council, whether that's with um, just the neighbors around you, your cop shop, you know, getting involved with uh, people who need assistance with something like SkillSkin or whatever. There are always community engagement things going on. Get involved. Like, don't spend your time sitting in front of the TV all day and then life is gone. Like, get out there, have some fun, bring your kids, just get involved in your community. You won't regret it. And that's how you make the world around you better. That's how you make your neighborhood safer and more fun. Get out there and do it. And reach out to me at ONS if you have questions. I'll chat you up and get you involved. Patrick, we are so grateful you're here today. Thank you for bringing us along. We're about community building. Get involved, everybody. Um, thank you. Thanks yeah, for being here. Absolutely. Happy to be here. <laughs>